Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us in this new episode. Today we're talking about James Moffat, Bible translator of the early 20th century. His dates are born in Glasgow, Scotland, July 4th, 1870. He died June 27th, 1944 in New York City. He's buried in Middle Village, Queens. Moffat has been called the grandfather of the modern English Bible largely by virtue of his 1935 translation entitled A New Translation of the Bible Containing the Old and New Testaments Revised. Well, just who was James Moffat? Britannica.com writes that he was a Scottish biblical scholar and translator who single-handedly produced one of the best-known modern translations of the Bible. We appreciate you tuning in to this episode featuring James Moffat and his Bible translations. Let's dive in a little deeper as we enter that hallowed hall where we join the League of Biblical Enthusiasts. Moffat. Between the two world wars, Moffat's Bible was the most popular modern speech version in America. I recently purchased this updated version with concordance from a local used bookstore for about $4. Well, Mr. James Moffat, was he qualified to translate the Bible? What about his education and his academic credentials? Did he have any presuppositions that surfaced in his translation? We will answer yes, most certainly. Was his translation formal, more literal, or functional? We would say more thought for thought. Definitely more functional. He was not afraid to t turn the translation into something modern English speakers in his day could understand in their own phrases, their own idioms, and their own terms. And what is his legacy among biblical translators? We will answer that he stands clearly as an innovator, writing in clear modern English of his day, but who may have too deeply entrusted himself to higher critical theories of the time. And you'll see what we mean by that as we go on. James Moffat was educated at Glasgow Academy and Glasgow University. He was ordained in the Church of Scotland in 1896. He served as a pastor for the first 16 years and then produced his first scholarly writings during that time. He received the degree of Doctor of Divinity from the University of St. Andrews in April 1902. He became Professor of Greek and New Testament exegesis at Mansfield College, Oxford in 1911. He returned to Glasgow in 1915 and Professor of Church History and the United Free Church College. From 1927 to 1939, he was Washburn Professor of Church History at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. During his career, he made contributions in biblical scholarship in biblical languages, interpretation of the Bible, church history, and theology. Over the course of his career, he authored at least 44 books by my count. He also edited a series of commentaries covering all the books of the New Testament. It was in 17 volumes, produced from 1928 to 1949, which were all based on his translation. In addition to theological and biblical works, he also wrote several books on English literature and made a contribution there. His first of two New Testament translations were published in 1901, and it secured for him an honorary Doctorate of Divinity from the University of St. Andrews. This work was an original translation of the New Testament in which he arranged the books in a different order than traditional Bibles, in line with the new critical New Testament scholarship of his time. 
His New Testament begins with 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and it ends with 1st and 2nd Peter. And I've provided for you a list of the New Testament books in his order on the screen. During the 19th century, biblical scholarship was undergoing many changes. Under the influence of what we might call or has been called liberal European scholarship, university professors were increasingly questioning traditional understandings of the Bible. Many doubted the historicity of the accounts of the flood, of the authorship of the Pentateuch by Moses, the authorship of Isaiah and other books of the Bible. One new theory, particularly gaining considerable ground, was the documentary Hypothesis. In his day, largely under the influence of Julius Wellhausen. The documentary Hypothesis is an explanation of how the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, was compiled. This is important because it had an impact on Moffat's translation of the Old Testament. In short, the documentary hypothesis held that the Torah was not authored by a single person, Moses, but rather was a compilation of at least four other sources, indicated by the letters J, E, D, and P. J for when the author preferred the name Yahweh, E for the author preferring the name Elohim, D for the Deuteronomist, as it is called, and then P for the priestly or legal or law code elements of the Torah. Each of these letters therefore stood for an author that were later combined around the fifth century BCE to form the Torah. Of course, this new explanation completely overturned centuries of understanding that was considered heretical by conservatives and it raised quite a stir in scholarly literature. James Moffat was most certainly not a conservative biblical scholar. He accepted many of the conclusions of this new scholarship. He denied the verbal inspiration of the Bible. He denied the historicity and traditional authorship of some of the books of the Bible. He believed the writers of the New Testament made mistakes in interpreting some of the Old Testament prophecies. He rearranged verses and whole chapters to what he thought was the best according to the new scholarship. In his translation of the Torah, he indicated two sources by either italics, which would be the J source, or brackets, the E source. And here's a page from Genesis chapter 1 that shows he puts chapter 2 verse 4 at the very beginning of Genesis, right before traditionally what we know is verse 1. And here's another page from Genesis that shows italic text indicating a different author from the surrounding text in Roman type. He does this liberally throughout the first five books of the Old Testament. And also note brackets at Genesis 20 indicating the E authorship of this passage and the translation the eternal for the name of God, that tetragrammaton we talked about several times, otherwise rendered Yahweh or Jehovah in many translations. He understood that Yahweh was probably the best and most literal translation, but at the last moment in his work decided to go with the eternal, which was favored in French translations of the Bible. Now for the New Testament, of his revised edition, he used the recently proposed Greek text of Hermann von Soden, which was generally considered an eccentric text and inferior to the Greek text of Westcott and Hort, gaining much credibility at the time. He often substituted conjectural emendations for the text of both testaments. Now, a conjectural emendation quite simply, is an educated guess of what the text said in situations where it was unclear. In the New Testament alone, he adopts some 30 conjectures that are unsupported by any manuscripts of his time. He likewise rearranged chapters in the New Testament as he did in the Old. For example, 
John chapter 14 comes after John 16, and he has a note to explain his decision. In John chapter 1, he transliterates the Greek word logos in the English logos rather than translating it as word. And he has a textual note for that as well. Certainly, James Moffat had his critics. F.F. F. Bruce tells the story where a modern young Scottish minister read a chapter from Moffat's New Bible to an elderly member of his flock. When he had finished reading, she looked up and said, Well, that was very nice. But now won't you just read a bitty of the Word of God before you go? Despite all the eccentricities, he also had his fans, and his translation was more readable than the King James Version, and many, many readers appreciated that. In particular, his translation of 1 Corinthians 13 is quite moving by its simplicity. It reads, Love is very patient, very kind. Love knows no jealousy. Love makes no parade gives itself no airs, is never rude, never selfish, never irritated, never resentful. Love is never glad when others go wrong. Love is gladdened by goodness, always slow to expose, always eager to believe the best, always hopeful, always patient. Love never disappears. And in his closing years, Moffat served as executive secretary of the Committee for the Revised Standard Version. And so he taught and worked on his passion through his very last years. Today, his personal papers, letters, lectures, and sermons and notes are held in a special archive collection at the University of Glasgow. If you're so inclined, you can find his translations of the Bible online, and you will be well rewarded. You'll find links to many resources we've mentioned in this episode in the description below. And I hope this has been helpful to you. If what you've heard has been educational, helpful, please like, subscribe, and share. We have so much more to share in this regard. As next week, we will feature another single translator of the Bible. So stay tuned and wait for the next one in about six or seven days from the League of Biblical Enthusiasts.